The Dickheads are presented in color. Hey, Dickheads! Like a pink laser beam of truth beaming from the entire West Coast to your brain hole, the Dickheads are back with a very special guest today. Uh... A cyberpunk legend, John Shirley, who, uh, in fact, was called by William Gibson the patient zero of cyberpunk, is joining us today. We're going to talk all about his career and some of the things that he's done in the genre. Um, but for most of you, I think uh, an introduction is not necessary. But John's got a new work of science fiction out, and we're going to be talking about that here eventually. But... Um, John, you also have a short story collection that just came out, Feverish Stars, that has an introduction by um, R.C. Matheson, son of Richard Matheson. You want to tell everybody about that collection real quick? Yeah, uh, The Feverish Stars. Uh, it is uh, stories that are new. Uh, some, there are several new ones, and um, recent, and none of them have ever been collected before. I've got a whole bunch of story collections. Um, including Black Butterflies, that won the Bram Stoker Awards. So that's the one people remember, but there are a lot of others. Uh, and uh, the Fever Stars is is sort of the new stuff I've been doing um, and things I thought needed to be collected over the last few years, last four years, say. Uh, and um, it, there's, there's a lot of intensity there. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, social commentary at the same time there's just a lot of uh, ex you know exploration of of uh, bizarrety um, but always you know with a story that you can follow I mean uh, I break the rules of surrealism a lot <laughs> well I think a John Shirley book that came out of the Trump years is something that many of us would be uh, very interested in almost automatically um, so yeah, the Feverish Stars is out now, but let's let's get to to some of the basics. I'm going to ask you the question that caused Norman Spinrad to call me stupid, which is, uh, <laughs> how did you get into genre fiction? I I pretty much know the answer because I know you pretty well, but for the listeners, like, what's your origin story with the fantastic? Uh, well, I I think I was. Uh, into it before I ever discovered it existed because as a kid I had to escape from certain circumstances in my life and and uh, so I I I, uh, I lived in a fantasy world in a lot of ways um, not in a uh, pathological way but uh, you know in a kind of a just a, 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 as a means of surviving and um, <clears throat> I told stories to other kids. Um, pretended they were my dreams. I had this dream last night that, and then, so then I could create this enormous story. Um, I think, I, and as a kid, I, I, uh, I did discover uh, in the local library, Robert E. Howard and Edgar Rice Burroughs and, and uh, uh, Ray Bradbury, the Ray Bradbury books collections, uh, and those had a big influence on me. And then my sister had a box of old Galaxy magazines, um, and uh, she just gave it to me one day. So I read through those. And um, but I, uh, I also read a lot of adventure-based stuff, and like uh, the Hornblower books by Forrester. So that kind of thing, where uh, I, I could I could imagine being heroic in the greater world, you know as young boys do. And um, so all of that, you know, it just, it gave me a kind of uh, alternate uh, identity that I could, that I could live in. And that, and, um, and I just projected it into different genres. So uh, I'll escape into this one or this one or this one. Well, in your career and your your writing and your storytelling is so um, linked to your life and rock and roll and and music and um, you just really can't pull one apart from the other. How did you get into music? You were in uh, Oregon, right? Growing up, like um, mostly Salem, I think, right? Um, yeah. After 
junior high school uh, and then on. I was in I was in Salem, Oregon, uh, a place now notorious for its uh, white supremacist demonstrations, and it was pretty. It was pretty uh, hyper conservative even then, so I didn't fit in. Uh, it was the beginning, you know, and it was like, well, toward the end of the '60s, uh, uh, I, you know, I fell under the influence of of proto punky things like Zappa and Beefheart, and then uh, the Animals, and then the Sonics and Garage Bands and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and. Well, uh, so when actual punk rock came along uh, in the 70s, um, I was, uh, I felt like I'd, I'd found my long lost family, you know, the Sex Pistols and the Clash and, and the Ramones. I, I instantly related. It was a, a redefining of, of rock and roll that was something that I'd kind of longed for and didn't know how to articulate. And so I, I started a band as soon as I could. Well, I did a bunch of them. In in at the same time, um, your science fiction and your genre of fiction was also redefining in a lot of ways because um, you were more than willing to kind of break the rules <laughs> and tell us a real story, uh, a weirder story from from the beginning. But of course, this was coming um, in the seventies after, you know, the new wave had happened in the sixties, what kind of influence did some of those sixties new wave voices have for you? Uh, well, I read, I read those people. I read, uh, Michael Moorcock mm -hmm. and not only his sword and sorcery, but also his new wave writing and his Jerry Cornelius sorts of things. And of course I did read a good deal of, of Philip K. Dick, um, Man in the High Castle, certainly, but also um, uh, like A Maze of Death, for example, had a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep and stories by him, certain, certain short stories by him. But uh, I think uh, The Man in the High Castle, uh, along with the, the novel 1984 and the novel... Um, uh, Brave New World, uh, th those those three books, uh, you know, told me that uh, you know I could I could make a statement that was really exciting to read. I mean, I could I could I could uh, dissect the all the things uh, that that I objected to about the world or that that you know terrified me about the world and and the, the kind of uh, the big machine that I saw behind things. Uh, politically and socially and 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 uh, and still make it entertaining because uh, uh, you know um, Aldous Huxley and and George Orwell and Philip K. Dick showed how you could do that and the man in the high castle obviously you know we he he gave us a way, another way to to look at Nazis so that we just saw them from the inside and we just and, and we saw what could happen if it came here, which laid, probably had a lot of reverberation in my Eclipse novels later, because in the Eclipse novels, the Eclipse trilogy, the, the song called You Cyberpunk Trilogy, mm -hmm. uh, has to do with neo-Nazism in America projected into the future of, of big media and, um, and a theocratic uh, goings-on, you know, theocratic... Uh, conspiracies mm -hmm. take yeah, over definitely. by takeovers by the Christian right. And then that then becomes fused with neo-Nazism. Well, and much like with a lot of the PKD books. Now we look back and say like, you know, I was just reading a book um, about the surveillance state in China called we have been harmonized. And PKD was talking about like these social credits that they're doing now in China in the fifties and the man who japed, right. Um, mm. and he was talking about these things and, and you had a kind of similar thing with a song called youth, um, trilogy, which you wrote in the eighties, especially when, um, project for a new American century and some of like the, the ties between the right wing Christian conservatives and the Hawks of the, the Bush administration during that era, we, mm. we kept thinking, well, oh, the song called youth trilogy really called it. And then it got worse. 
Yeah. <laughs> and it got closer. Um, so much the way that we're still seeing the reverberations of PKD, um, you know, nailing certain things, how does it feel for you as a science fiction social critic to see some of these things come true, specifically with that trilogy? Well, kind of terrifying. I, I, uh, when Trump was elected and, um, and was so blatant about uh, lying um, on television, uh, lying uh, on Twitter, just blatantly manipulating people with a big lie in, in, in his, his, own, his own sort of uh, reality TV show version of the big lie. Uh, I, I, I was really struck by the, the parallels between that and my Eclipse novels, the song called Youth Books. Um, I, I did predict someone like him. And the use of media to uh, the new media, you know, uh, to re reverberate lies out into every little part of the uh, zeitgeist, you know, and the and the uh, the overmind of the world. Um, that's something I I portrayed, and and it came true in Trump. The the whole the whole fracturing of truth that that. Uh, are, you know, like I wrote a piece called, recently, a nonfiction piece called Is Truth Dead? Um, be, and it's all about how the, you know, the internet, which should have been this very liberating thing, has become at least as dark as, as it is liberating, uh, as, at least as oppressive, really, um, because um, what should have been some tiny little uh, John Birch Society-like um, micro movement, you know, sprang into, into uh, a macrocosm uh, through the internet, uh, the, the emergence of, of white nationalism as a real force, the QAnon nonsense uh, as, a, as a real force. It's just amazing to me that QAnon has an impact and that those people um, are actually in the Congress, some of them. And that just goes to show how weakened our whole, the underlying premise of, of consensus truth is in our society now. And, um, uh, and you know, and you saw a lot of that in PKD, I think. You, you know, we, he was often kind of exploring how uh, uh, subjective reality it is very fragile and very malleable uh, and uh, just challenging um, uh, our uh, ability to really find a fixed point uh, in of shared reality. And he, he was warning us, I think. Yeah, and I think constantly about how it would have been really interesting to see how PKD would have um, uh, interpreted the internet and climate change and those things and and, and as I was reading Stormland, which we'll get to later, uh, I was just really thankful that we have, you know, your voice um, to, to comment on these things because we are seeing a window of, of how the genre um, will deal with these things and, um, and, and somebody from, uh, you know, from that era. But um, on to PKD a, a little bit more. He... Um, you know, for, for, for me, I was very young when, when he passed away. And so most of my consumption of, of PKD has been um, after his death. And I know that you went to Clarion when um, uh, Harlan Ellison was a teacher and that, you know. Ursula Le Guin and Frank Herbert, too. Wow. Robert Silverberg, too. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's that's pretty high powered teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, so you've interfaced with some of these people from from the new wave. Um, did you ever get a chance to meet BKD or? Cause, no, yeah. I have friends who are friends of him. Like Tim Powers is my friend, and he was a protege of mm -hmm. Philip K. Dick, and he <clears throat> tells me stories about him. But um, uh, I didn't get to meet him. But I know I and Spinrad knew him pretty well, you know. And Spinrad would talk about him. Uh, and I and Spinrad was a friend of mine. He's still a friend of mine. I just haven't seen him in years. 
Um, so I just, just like from one degree removed, but I didn't meet, I didn't meet him. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I knew him though, because, um, I, I read pretty much everything by him, especially even as a very challenging latterly things and things and, uh, the, uh, uh, the exegesis even the exegesis uh, yeah and um well th that's the thing is i think um uh we do get a chance to as scholars there's a lot more about pkd out there to research than some writers and 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 i appreciate that um you know that we have so much to to study but okay so for your work in the genre i mean your science fiction masterpiece is probably this one, uh, City Come a Walkin'. Um, however, I, I think there's arguments could be made for several of your science fiction books, but, and we'll get to City Come a Walkin' in a little bit, but the one that I think for, because, you know, we always talk on this podcast about dick-like suggestions books, and um, Stormland was our dick-like suggestion on our Galactic Pot Healer episode, our last episode, um, uh, for several reasons. Uh, that we'll get to when we get to that book. But when I think of like your most Philip K. Dick style or book that reminds me of Philip K. Dick and influence is this one uh, that I'm holding up for the video, Three Rings Psychus, which is, um, which reminds me of books like his high concept books, like Counter Clock World, for example, which was about time going backwards. And this book with this really great high concept of it's about, um, gravity, st uh, uh, kind of an apocalypse where gravity stops working, the great unwaiting, <laughs> right? Um, could you talk a little bit about this book and kind of where it came from? And it, this, is, this is such an interesting book. Let me just say that there's a, the, the uh, version of that book to read is, is I changed the title, uh, which was always kind of awkward. The Mm -hmm. um, the version to read is called High, H-I-G-H, High. And um, that is re-edited by me. I uh, needed that too. And uh, you can find that as an e-book. Um, the, the novel is about, uh, a, technically, it's, yeah, it's about the great unwaiting when a certain amount of... Uh, of uh, gravitational uh, energy in the earth is, is summarily canceled. And uh, you find out toward the end of the book, why it happened, at least in, you know, whether or not it could very improbable, but, but it makes for a great um, uh, canvas to, to paint, but you know, wild images on, I mean, because people just started floating upward and they, kind of congested in a cloud and so cer certain things like heavier things like cars floated lower and then uh, furniture part way above that and then people above that and other things you know so there's a stratified cloud of things over cities and um, and that right there is kind of reflects uh, my um, participation in, in uh, surrealism influence of writers like J.G. Ballard is very surreal influence, uh, surrealist influence. I mean, Ballard's early novels like The, the Drowned World, The Crystal World were also very high concept things. The Crystal World, everything starts to crystallize around you and, and uh, everything adds this extra dimension of crystallization uh, across the whole world. And it, and it made this <clears throat> beautiful image in the, in the mind of the reader. It was, a, it was like a Max Ernst image. It was very surreal. Uh, and um, so I, you know, uh, I, I was uh, drawn to that kind of staging where I could stage a surrealist painting that also had an underlying rationale so that you could suspend disbelief and follow it. And so I, <clears throat> I started with that. And then, then I had to find out what caused this. And it was a metaphysical um, explanation, ultimately, of everybody's, uh, the, the uh, sort of underlying um, psychic energy of the world, which is also something you find in the novel City Come a Walkin', um, links up 
through everybody and becomes magnified and counts as part of the gravity. Uh, and then some people develop um, telekinetic powers and a lot of things happen and there's this whole social upset. So it's as if the whole world is, is rebooted by this process uh, before it, it um, I won't, I won't let them tell you what happens toward the end, but you can find it in the novel high as a, as an ebook. And, it's and, you great. know, uh, there's, there's probably, um, yeah, a counterclock world. I mean, it's, it's one of those high concept uh, science fiction novels like Philip Dick would do and JG Ballard would do. Um, and uh, it enabled me to have to just have a, a, a field day with fantastic, bizarre images that I could nevertheless, you know, weave into an adventure story. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get everything. You get you get the surreal, uh, you know the, uh, you know that that has a lot of that brings a lot of uh, intellectual um, uh, aesthetic satisfaction, and and also you you get the the uh, the tight storytelling uh, if you have that kind of you work from that kind of science fiction concept. Mm -hmm. Now, City Come a Walking is. Um um, kind of about the beating heart of, of, of cities. And what's funny is, is that, um, you know, three time in a row, Hugo winning author MK Jemison um, has a book that has a very similar kind of storyline modernized uh, in the city we became. And it's funny because as, as, as a person who city come walking is one of my favorite books, as I read the city we became, I kept, you know, that book is about how the different parts of New York City kind of developed their own personalities. And I went, ah, <laughs> you know, um, and this book, I think, is, a, is, is definitely going to get nominated for that book is going to get nominated for pretty much everything this year. But it's also in conversation with Lovecraft. It's a very interesting book. But this is a concept that, you know, you tackled in 1978 with City Come a Walking, which is the beating heart of the city kind of becoming one and becoming energy. Could you talk about City Come A-Walking? Well, I was interested in Carl Jung and his ideas of the collective uh, unconscious. And then I sort of took those ideas and extrapolated them in a little li too literally, perhaps, uh, and thought, well, what is the collective unconscious of a city? Because I was a very, I was very caught up in, in the energy of the urban environment. It was very, uh, much a part of my my youth, partly from going to rock concerts, actually. And you you go to a rock concert, and and some some of the time I was high uh, at the concert, and so I I would have a, just a sense of the of this um, this kind of collective energy that was that everybody was taking part in, and it was as if we were all telepathically connected at the concert. You felt that. Um, sometimes only felt it in your gut. Sometimes it, it was a little more literal. It really, you really felt that sometimes there was a, that there was imagery that was passing through the whole concert, through the just through minds alone. <clears throat> and so that suggested to me, well, what if that's extended to a city? Um, and I chose the city of San Francisco, where I was at the time. Uh, or on and off, I was. I would go down there and stay for long periods. So I go to, uh, you know, punk rock clubs and rock shows down there. Um, and uh, and I tried to evoke the the kind of the street level, uh, you know, um, metropolis, so that you got the sense of people on the street like like um, transgender prostitutes and. And, uh, uh, and, you know, like local organized crime people. Uh, and also I, I evoked uh, rock clubs. <clears throat> and, the, and I had a character based on Patti Smith, who was one of the main characters. She was sort of my Patti Smith. And, and so I was weaving all through the book, you know, rock and roll was a big part of it. And I, I you know, I put uh, bits of lyrics into it that I made up for it. And uh, it was a very rock energy sort of book. Um, and then the, the, in the book, uh, the, the city of San Francisco becomes personified in a, in a person, just totally transforms a certain person. 
and uh, that person has like they can make all the lights go green for them uh, you know if they're driving along and all these other things happen that you see in in other kinds of urban fantasy novels later people people later on went on to borrow these ideas um just as a certain person wrote a novel about American gods, that's rather like another one of my books. But um, uh, we'll just skip over that and Mr. Jemison's uh, generous yeah. borrowing of the idea. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sure it's a very good book. Um, I, you know, um, I wrote a paperback original novel and I was pretty early in my writing career and, and uh, I think it's a lot of inspiration in the book, but I was probably not the most sophisticated writer in the world at the time. But there's a lot of great ideas in it. And William Gibson wrote an introduction to a later version of it that can be found. Uh, William Gibson, the author of Neuromancer and so on. And he said that it was an influence on him. Uh, that be, and it was mostly the way I talked about the street uh, and how people's uses of early technology. And at, I, pre, I predict at the time that I wrote it, <clears throat> ATMs did not exist, but, mm. but I predicted them in the book and I predicted the il increasingly electronic nature of our money and like the consequences of that. And there was a lot of poetic metaphor about the relationship of man to the city and, uh, and consensual mind uh, in, in the book that a lot of people related to. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, and it's a fantastic, uh, very forward-thinking um, piece of work from, from the era. And, yeah, you also kind of foresaw the Internet with the grid in, 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 um, in a song called Youth um, Trilogy, too. Yeah, uh, the, the grid was, yeah, the grid and the grid friend was my thought of, about the Internet, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and certainly... Um, uh, the, I think City Come a Walking um, has conscious and unconscious influence um, because, uh, for example, the fact that it was an influence on on William Gibson, um, probably City Come a Walking has had a bigger influence on some people who probably don't even have not even read the book that are more influenced by the person who was influenced by it um, in, in that sense. And I, I would say that uh, happened. Yeah, yeah, uh, it happens in music as well, uh, where bands, you know, who influence uh, bands that become huge, you know. And uh, so I think City Come a Walking is a book that definitely anyone who's serious about the canon of science fiction, um, uh, I think it's it's one that uh, people should go back and explore. It's coming out in a, um, uh, a special edition, a special collector's edition that's one of these hardbound, fancy editions, uh, but I'm not going to say who the publisher is yet because he hasn't sent me the contract, but it's coming. So there will be, there will be a, 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 collect, a collector's limited edition of City Come a Walking pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And it's in, it's in, a, uh, and it's out as an ebook, and then there are other editions that one can find, and I'm going to get it out as a, uh, as a, uh, a paperback again pretty soon. And not just because it's set in San Francisco, it's, it's definitely worthy of dick-like suggestion uh, for, for, for those dickheads out there looking for stuff that's, you know, similar in vain. So, um, but let's get, to the, let's get to the new novel. You've still been, you've been writing science fiction for, you know, still for the last couple of years, but this is the first novel-length science fiction that we've gotten from you in a little while. Um, we had your amazing Western, Wyatt and Wichita, um, what it was I believe the last full length novel that we got from you and before, or or maybe that was before Doyle After Death. Was that before Doyle After Death? Yeah, it was. Doyle After Death was was a uh, yeah, it's a, a novel of the afterlife and of mm -hmm. Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of the Sh of Sherlock Holmes in the Afterlife. If you find the paperback of it, they're worth a lot of money. They sold out and they didn't reprint them. Mm -hmm. But you can you can get it as an ebook. Doyle after death, you know, really, well, no one's getting really weird copy. book. <laughs> no matter how much they offer me, no one's getting my copy. Uh, Doyle after death is a great metaphysical fantasy. So it's not that you didn't have written a novel of, of in genre to a degree, but, but 
straightforward science fiction that that is very similar in vain to i i would say this one is kind of similar in vain to me to the um song called youth books and in tone it's very high energy it's it's very adventurous but um it's clear that um this book it's your first um kind of high concept environmental novel since demons which of course is is one of my all-time favorites but this is the first time that you're addressing, you've addressed environmental issues many, many times in your fiction before, but this is the first straight up cli-fi book. And um, as cli-fi has become a genre, as soon as you told me about this book, I said, hell yeah, because I wanted, because as cli-fi is becoming a regular genre where the world is reacting to climate change, I wanted to hear what John Shirley had to say. And it was no surprise to me that it seemed like the events of Katrina and the aftermath there seemed to be a huge influence on this novel. Where did Stormland come from? Yeah, Katrina, things like that have probably helped seed it. I was looking for a, a metaphor to express the idea uh, that was growing in me about uh, basically the, the feeling that people really underestimated um, the impact of extreme weather in uh, uh, as a result of, of climate change. I mean, the, the, uh, I was looking for a way to, to also express the uh, social uh, impact of, that, of, of extreme weather. Um, you know, like the, uh, the displacement of people. And I, and I wanted something that would, that would like stand for, for everything. So I, I thought of the big red spot on Jupiter. The planet Jupiter has this permanent storm. It's that big red spot you can see when you look at a picture of Jupiter. It's, it's a, a gigantic storm about as big as the Earth, I think, uh, at least as big as our moon, really big. And it goes on perpetually. Um, <clears throat> what if we had one in the United States, in a certain part of the United States? That was a consequence of, uh, you know, various uh, dynamics of the uh, climate change scenario that we're finding ourselves in. Very plausibly thought out, too, with how you talk about what's happening to the Amazon rainforest and the 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 chopping down the deforestation for cattle ranching and, and that kind of thing, um, which is explained really well in your book. Um, how much of the research did you do into the science of that? It sounds like you... It well, a lot. I, I did a lot. I, I always research a lot. Um, I also consulted uh, some friends at the Stanford Research Institute where I had done some a little bit of consulting myself. Uh, um, I had been a consultant there briefly uh, as, as part of a special project. And then uh, I went to other people who were working there and um, I consulted with them about uh, various scenarios uh, that might arise from uh, extreme climate change shifts. And um, uh, I just read extensively about it too. Um, and then uh, uh, it, it just uh, it kind of kept, just kept fulminating in my mind. I kept seeing images. You know, I, I visualize that about a billion people will be displaced by climate change um, in this century. And by displaced, I mean they will be forced into migration in large numbers. And that will have catastrophic effects socially across the world. Um, it's not that they're troublesome immigrants. It's that they're refugee. They're going to be refugees from terrible climate change situations. And we have to find ways to help them. We have to find ways to... Uh, uh, to to uh, find new... Um, living situations for them and integrate them into the rest of the world. And, you know, it may be part of the USA. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that um, a lot of Southeast, the Southeast USA is going to be uh, abandoned actually. And the late 20th century, the uh, 21st century, uh, 
in in uh, the feverish stars, uh, I have a story, <clears throat> my story, um, a state of imprisonment in which the entire state of Arizona becomes one big privatized prison. All, you know, like 90% of the state of Arizona. Could it really happen quite like that? Probably not. That was in the case of a metaphor, you know, that that is a little bit of a hyperbole. Uh, but Exaggeration it, to clarify. <laughs> uh, but it, is still, it doesn't matter because it, it, it's, you know, every time I think that we're, that, that, uh, no, that something could never happen. Like somebody like Trump could never, for example, become president. Then, then, you know, life becomes satire. You can't separate life from satire sometimes. And maybe it could happen because the privatized prisons is this huge blot in our society and our economy. Uh, and there's and they're just getting huge. They're very big. They're very big in Arizona. So as a consequence of Arizona being, uh, you know, like fried basically by uh, climate change, uh, it's pretty much abandoned. So they were able to to build this giant privatized prison on mostly underground. And I describe how you know what the mechanism of that is and so on. And and then. The story is about a, a reporter, who, a woman reporter who is trapped in this place. She, uh, and, uh, and I have read that. That was in the um, uh, Outspoken Author series, too. Yeah it, yeah, it was in New Taboos, and I revised it and expanded it a bit uh, for um, The Fever Stars. So it's, it's a novelette that starts that. out The Fever Stars. And, and that's an example it. of, like, you know... A, uh, like how bad it could get is what I'm saying. Right. Uh, and if I read it before, I might have skipped it. Now that I know when I get to Fever of Stars, now I know that you revised it. I'll have to read it again. I, I revise everything, you know, when I re get it reprinted in some place because there's always something that I wish I had done better before. Well, so uh, all my new novel, all all novels that go into it as, as e-books have been re-edited by me and improved. So that's yeah. why I'm so insistent that people read high instead of three ring psychos and books like that. Mm -hmm. Well, it, the thing about it is, um, and it's funny too, because you and I've had that argument before, because I like seeing the intention that you had at the time. And I understand that you make things better, mm -hmm. but um, uh, for it, part of me as a purist always wants to know what the intention was at the time. Well, I don't change the intention. I just, I, know, I, I just, know. I just, I just, I just kind of like, uh, uh, I, I just bring it into better focus. I know, I know. You and I have had this argument before, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, so Stormland, Stormland um, is is an attempt to create a metaphor uh, for our situation in that there's a, a part of America called Stormland where. Um, it, it, there is a storm 24-7, 365 days a year, year after year. Yeah, and you talked about privatism in this, in this book as well. You got a little digging on the FBI with the Justice Incorporated thing. Justice Incorporated. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, you know, um, we have some shifts. We have a little bit of a shift to the left now in this country, which I like. But uh, I, I really think that it's going to be a struggle to – to uh, to keep it, uh, and and the the danger of falling into that kind of um, trickle down nightmare, uh, you know, um, that kind of the, of fantasy based uh, economic model uh, that Reagan perpetuated and promulgated and is is very very big, and they're trying to they're are they're trying to destroy the post office so they can privatize it, you know, so that they can replace it with just businesses. Um, and it will be far less efficient. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I make fun of how that happens to the justice department in, in Stormland that becomes, a, it's basically a, a private company that's taken over the justice department. Yes. Um, now, yeah. one of the things about this book too, and in, in, in the writing of it is that, um, it's kind of classic, surely, um, exaggerate to clarify to, um, you know, where borderline satire, political commentary, it's all great. But one of the things that narratively you had to do with this book was to figure out, and this, 
creates all kinds of interesting characters because who would who would live in Stormland? Who would make the choice to be in Stormland? And for that reason, this book has lots of really great, interesting characters. Can you talk about some of the characters that are in Stormland? Because this is one of the highlights for me of this book. Well, some of them are are people who, because in this new in this this part of the United States uh, projected future, there there is a, a sort of uh, Trumpian slant to things. Uh, em immigrants um, are finding uh, it hard to resettle, and um, sometimes uh, they're they're being pursued by the future's version of ICE. Uh, and so um, some of them are hiding in Stormland, um, and also um, developing a kind of alternate little microcosmic uh, societies and subcultures there. Um, there's a, a woman who is a, 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 a black woman who's a, a, a lesbian. She lives with, she had, she's there with her lover and she got in some, um, she was basically framed because of some stuff she found out when she was a, uh, in law enforcement in uh, the Louisiana area. And so they're sort of hiding out uh, from those forces in Stormland. And uh, she becomes um, uh, a major kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, assistant, not really, more like a partner of our, our hero, the uh, former U.S. Marshal who's trying to set things straight in Stormland. Um, I think she's an important character. And um, then there, there are these uh, Cuban um, uh, immigrants who have a, a really interesting basis in, in a, in a uh, real life uh, Cuban underground movement. Um, and we learn about them and their, and, you know, their, their uh, subculture. Um, there's a guy who is a, uh, uh, has a, a little uh, enclave uh, where he he runs things and it's a sort of small um, community of scroungers, people who who in during lulls between storms, which are very brief, and through uh, the ways they've created to evade the storms a bit, uh, they uh, scavenge. Um, throughout uh, the city and uh, they, and uh, find valuable items and, and metal that they can then sell through, you know, his organization outside of the city. So he, he but in order to kind of keep things in line in this very chaotic uh, situation, he's created a, an alternative religion where they're basically worshiping the storm gods. Uh, and he's a really pretty interesting character. He's from he, he's from New Zealand, and he's a, he's a Kiwi uh, cult leader, but a benevolent one. And there's a, uh, there's a character who is a former uh, serial killer. And I say yeah, I was former. I'm to give that one away because that one knocked my socks off. Um, he is, you know, how he becomes former, really former, is just, you know, is science fiction. And that's part of the science fiction that is extrapolated in the story. I think it will happen. Uh, that kind of thing, but uh, so uh, what, he was, you know, once one of the worst people around, and he becomes the kindest man in Stormland, um, and so he's a pretty weird character. Uh, and our and he, and our hero is forced to partner with this guy who, as a former lawman, he has difficulty trusting very much. Um, but they get a weird kind of rapport, uh, and there, there's a character who's a, based on. Um, uh, um, a certain uh, pharmacological uh, industrialists uh, that that exist now, um, who's who has a sky yacht, and the sky yacht is this enormous vehicle that they that uh, the the rich and decadent use in the future, and some of them use it to use them to ride on the storms uh, that are plaguing the earth in the future. Uh, they're sort of surfing along the top of the storms as a sort of pastime. So it's Yo. super wealthy people doing this and it's very decadent and it's symbol and it symbolizes something. That was one of my 
favorite uh, moments and uh, one where I was like, ah, he beat me. He beat me to that one <laughs> because I had uh, uh, had once thought of the concept. I was like, well, wouldn't people just try to get up over the heat, you know? And uh, um, in my novel, Goddamn Killing Machines, they built cit cities to up basically on stilts in the future to get up over the heat. And so that was a but is it really cooler up there or is it? And that's another that's a question that in these new situations it's hard to say. It is hard to say, but I the sky yachts thing, I I, I that was great. Now the serial killer character, I was I was I was trying not to give that one away, but since you mentioned it, um th this character and him and the marshal and their relationship was um was one of the trickiest ones. I think you could build a whole novel out of that. Of that science fiction. Yes, you could. Uh, you could, and in fact, I'm hoping this will be the first of three novels about Stormland. I've left a lot of things. The story is concluded, and it stands alone, but I, I have so many things that are kind of hinted at in this book um, that um, I would like to explore in subsequent books, including the these giant towers that are a, a means of perhaps of both of creating uh, space elevators and a way to deal with the excessive heat on the earth. Um, but I just hint, I just talk about them indirectly in this. Um, and here I'll do a Vanna White with the book. Yeah. And look, it's backwards. Will it, will it look, will it look backwards? No, no, you? no, not, not just, that's just it's so you. weird when that happens for me, it, it's backwards, but um, it, it's not like that. It's like this. And it's uh, so Vanna White. Yes, and uh, I look a I, lot like her. <laughs> I ordered mine from uh, Mysterious Galaxies. Um, uh, Pre-ordered mine. I haven't gotten it yet, of course, but um, but uh, I'm pushing them to uh, to uh, put that one um, on an end cap for when they start opening up. To uh, they were talking about having a a, uh, a virtual. Um, appearance by me through mysterious galaxy with greg bear i'm waiting to see if it's going to happen oh that would be great um you can ask them but uh mysterious galaxies is my local store and so of course uh i'd love to hear that um but as far as um you know you when, when you build out these ideas um you know you have so so many ideas in this book but on it is very much in the, um, like one of the things that I think is great is that even though you know the storms are going to be like a propulsive building thing in the narrative, that they're going to be there all the time, um, you do such a great job of building suspense with the storms and with the and building the cycles of the, the lulls between, the short lulls between the storms and when the storms come back into the narrative. Um, was this outline? Did you outline that ahead of time, or was that just some, a, a pace and a rhythm that you felt as you were writing? Well, I felt it had to happen. There had to be a, a kind of a rhythm to the to that society, and there and I, the storms are you know storms come marching in, so one ends and another is immediately on the horizon. So then there's a little bit of a lull where you can get some things done. <clears throat> but the city is, you know, uh, flooded all the time and you have to stay up above certain levels in the higher buildings. And uh, uh, even, even in the lulls, there's, you know, there's maybe lightning, there's, there's a lot of, of heavy weather even then. But uh, uh, I, did, I did think from the beginning that there had to be that kind of... Um, pacing and you know it, nature's own pacing mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I tried to to justify it uh, uh, with my research and and find ways to, to make it uh, seem reasonable I, I mean I don't think there's anything in the in the novel that some of it gets very close to satire uh, but uh, I don't think there's anything that couldn't actually happen um, I think even even the uh, the darkest, weirdest element of the plot, which I won't go into. Uh, it's a revelation in the story as it goes on. Uh, even that could happen, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, I would put Stormland into 
the category of um, uh, the subgenre that I like to call the warning novel. Um, you're a last Babylon's, you're on the beach, but also specifically environmentally, um, I think of novels like Bruner's The Sheep Look Up or Stand on Zanzibar. Um, this is a, an environmental warning novel uh, for sure and stands to be in there. And, and if the temperatures keep rising in the Atlantic, it's it's not that hard of, uh, hard of a thing to, to imagine. Really. It's a kind of fusion, this novel of genres. And, you know, a lot of the best things come from syntheses, you know. I synthesized um, cyberpunk and, and, the, and the futuristic crime novel, the detective novel, uh, and um, the uh, disaster novel mm -hmm. uh, in, into one um, neo-genre, at least in my making, in my vision of it. Yeah, I, I would say this is, um, uh, for fans of, of John Shirley's work, I would say this is John Shirley cranked to 11's Final Tap style because, um, like, a lot of those elements are all there and it's just cranked up. Um, and, and that's one of the things that made me really happy about this novel is because um, whether it's the um, super sharp social satire of um, state of imprisonment or... Uh, the cyberpunk elements with, you know, um, especially how the younger characters kind of inter interface with the book. Um, that's, that's very John Shirley too. And um, with the environmental aspects and, you know, the, the warning aspects of it, it's just, it's, um, and I say this as, as, as a super fan, this is, this is very John Shirley and um, was definitely in, in many ways the, the novel I was, you know, when you announced, when you first uh, told me about this novel, a couple, I mean, it would have been years ago now, um, I've been dying. It took me a long time to finally get it into shape. Yeah, and um, I've been dying to read it, and um, anybody who knows me knows I do not like to read on the computer. I do not like to read e-versions, but because in order to read it early, I had to, and um, I flew through this one Um even though I had to, to read it on a screen, <laughs> which is saying something for me. And I can't wait to get the hardback, uh, which I'm getting. Very right. handsome hardback. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, it, this, um, so talk about the design of the book and, 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 and what, what people are getting um, a little bit, like this is Blackstone Publishing, correct? Um, yeah, Blackstone uh, started out <clears throat> as an audio book company and made a, a big success of it and they became probably the most prominent one uh ubiquitous you put if you like if you go to the library and look at their audio books there they're probably two-thirds of them are, are blackstone and then uh they were so successful with that they decided to go into um physical printed books um and yeah, books, um, amazing ebooks and and um uh, come up with their own, uh, and they um, uh, they've given Stormland a shot. That um, they've they've really made uh, a lot of big progress, and they're they're becoming major players in publishing now. Yeah, the book looks beautiful, and um, I'm uh, really excited for people to check it out and to read it. Um, what are there any? Um, Final, is there anything that I miss as far as, as Stormland goes? Things that you feel um, this novel, uh, th this novel really feels like it, it's very exciting for me to to get your. We've I've gotten your commentary nonfiction wise online about climate change all through the years, and uh, but to really um, address this one with with a novel length story with, with climate change, I feel like. Um, this is a long time coming um, as far as not just the process of getting this book ready, but um, how, how does it feel to really be um, finally getting to, to comment on climate change? Because I know we're all, we should be terrified about climate change, right? This should be. Oh, uh, I think that uh, the people are in some denial <laughs> about it. Because, right. Because it kind of, it's sort of creeping up on us. Um, Although what happened last summer uh, in Australia and in California, and 
uh, also uh, even in Oregon, the, the, um, and that's something that I don't get into in the book, except very, I, I think I mentioned it or something, but um, it, it, the wildfires are, uh, ought to be some kind of alarm bell for people. It, it, it should uh, prompt them to really sit up and look around. The, the extent of them and the power uh, and the, the just, just the vastness of them. We've always had wildfires, fires, of course, they're even just part of nature. But <clears throat> this is something else. This is, this is like a, um, a runaway, uh, a manifestation of, of wildfires. And, it's, and it should really uh, be a wake-up call. Um, and there's that, uh, to, you know, look around at that. And also um, the, the speed with which uh, a Antarctic, uh, Antarctic ice and ice in Greenland is melting. Uh, it's even faster than the people had envisioned, which means the water of the sea will rise up um, and uh, may overcome, you know, New York and certainly parts of Florida. Um, and uh, uh, the the uh, great numbers uh, of of uh, extreme weather conditions in the in form of typhoons and hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, we've always had those too, not this much, not this powerfully. Um, they, are, they are just marching through and it's almost stormland in the Southeast right now. Well, which, or my book is set in the Southeast of the USA. Well, speaking of somebody who wrote a, a cli-fi novel about wildfires, um, I, it is a very, I, you have to look forward to when the storms keep start hitting South Carolina regularly and then the Southeast. And you have that nervous thing of saying like, well, it is like my novel, but I look like a total asshole if I, if I use this to say like, hey, look at my book. Because with the wildfires, I had that experience, you know, because I had a lot of people writing me saying like, hey, it reminds me of your book. And I'm just be like, I did not happy about that. <laughs> you know, um, and so when those storms start hitting South Carolina and Florida, and Florida starts getting this narrow, we'll yeah. we'll we'll, um, we'll have that nervous moment of uh, we'll, we'll do it for you. We'll say, hey, it's that it's just like uh, Stormland. <laughs> but um, uh, so, uh, John, um, where can uh, the dickheads? Um, is, is there? Um, uh, somewhere you want to send them. I think they should hear your music too. Um, you, you've been uh, pumping out some pretty good rock and roll of late. So can you um, sum up where people can find your band, the Screaming Geezers and so on? Screaminggeezers.com. It's that simple. Screaminggeezers.com. Um, and uh, there are two sample songs there. One, uh, one of them recorded live. We opened for the Blue Oyster Cult uh, last year. Uh, and, uh, of course, I've written a lot of songs on the new Blue Oyster Cult album. When I wrote five, um, The Symbol Remains is the album. And it's a hit album, you know. It's, it's um, uh, last I looked, at, it was number 12 on um, Billboard's album sales. Uh, and uh, I wrote the two singles on it. Which you can find, you can find them on YouTube. And but I only wrote the lyrics. Florida man. <laughs> yeah, Florida man is funny, um, and uh, it's controversial. And two newspapers wrote it up in Florida. That song, Florida man. And you can find the song on YouTube, and um, one of them condemned it, and the other one uh, wrote an appreciation of it and re reprinted all the lyrics and everything. It's. It's, you know, just very uh, amusing narrative. Part of me, uh, that was a Screaming Geezer song, I got to say. But, you know, it, it's good uh, for a Blue Oyster cult. Anywho, John, uh, <laughs> on that note, um, anything else you want to leave the dickheads with before we go? I'll just say that A Scanner Darkly was an influence on me, I think. Um, it's the way he described things um, in, in the most subjective and, and like, you know, personal way, you know, through, through 
through a man's personal darkness and all and and uncertainty about what the, what is real and and also this this urban feeling about it that he is able to evoke in a, in a special way mm -hmm. uh, and I think that book was an influence on um, people like William Gibson and and uh, no Pat Cadigan and other cyberpunk writers no doubt no doubt all right uh, dickheads uh, Stay paranoid, keep it paranoid, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time.